Any comment, John? Okay, I think we'll go ahead and start. We may have uh, people uh, continuing to join us here over the next few minutes, um, but in um, uh, respect of everybody's time, I'd like to get going. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Tom Fleischner. I am the executive director of the Natural History Institute based here in Prescott, Arizona, in the Mogollon Highlands of Arizona. And it's my um, honor and pleasure to be the host for our event here tonight. And to uh, first of all, welcome you here to this wonderful event on behalf of the Natural History Institute. We're a nonprofit institution based here uh, and part of our mission is to integrate art, science and humanities uh, in, in as we help people connect with nature. So this is a wonderful uh, event to, to help us do that. Uh, and if you are interested, this is actually the first event in a new series of events we have called Stories of Nature and Culture. So if you'd be interested in seeing more of what's coming up, you can check out our website, which will be uh, on the chat at the end, uh, which is just naturalhistoryinstitute.org. Um, so I'd also, uh, as we start, I'd like to acknowledge, um, we have some wonderful co-sponsor partners here tonight. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge all of them. Uh, first of all, ASLI, the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment. Uh, next, the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Uh, the Fiction Meets Science program at the University of Bremen, Germany. The Peregrine Book Company, independent bookstore here in Prescott, Arizona. And last but not least, Tory House Press, uh, who is the publisher of this wonderful book we're gonna be focusing on tonight. Um, before I go further, I wanted to give a shout out to um, our uh, wonderful intern, Zora Elunga reed who is our tech support tonight. She's in New York City, so thank you so much, Zora. She's the one uh, literally behind the scenes who is uh, helping all this run smoothly. Um, so uh, that uh, we really appreciate that work. So uh, before I introduce um, our panelists tonight, our really esteemed group of people, I wanted uh, to just mention a couple things about Zoom and how that's gonna work. I know many of us are spending more of our lives than we ever imagined in this format recently. Um, we have had, as you know, the, the chat uh, function has been on uh, as we've been, have people have been joining and introducing ourselves. Uh, we're about to turn that off until near the end of the of session because we just uh, are trying to keep this as focused and, um, uh, uh, as, as few distractions as possible so we can focus on the readings and, and the discussion that we'll be having. We will a little bit later be having a, a Q&A, a question and answer section, which is a, a specialized chat function. And I'll explain that when we get to that uh, point in the, eve in the I don't know, it's evening for some of us and it's the middle of the night for others. <laughs> and um, so, um, before I go on, just wanted to say why we're uh, doing this event. So this, we're, we're here to discuss this wonderful book, Accidentals, um, written by Susan M. Gaines, who you see on the screen, uh, published by Tory House Press. And um, when, as I, as I mentioned, the Institute is focused on the integration of art, science, and humanities. And uh, when I read the book, I was uh, lucky enough to get a, an early copy of it. I was just struck by the authenticity of the book uh, and a number of different realms, not least in the realm of natural history, uh, nat uh, bird watching and so on. It just felt very, very real. So it's a book that uh, for those of you who have not yet read it, I think you're gonna all want to read it. Um, that very deftly weaves together um, a number of unlikely partners, you might say, which is uh, everything, natural history, endangered species biology, um, Latin American political history, uh, and not least a really compelling love story at the heart of, of, the, of the novel. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a wonderful example, I think, of some of the kind of integration that we are interested in here at the Institute. So Susan and I got talking about uh, ways to collaborate on this, and here we all are uh, with this uh, wonderful group of, of panelists to help us explore this. So, um, and by the way, we have in the um, uh, materials and at the end and so on, we will have a link uh, if you're interested in purchasing the book uh, from our co-sponsor, the, the Peregrine Book Company, we will have that information up as well. Um, so uh, we have uh, 
a great group to explore this. So uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Annalise Borzakansky, um, who is joining us actually from Florida uh, tonight. Uh, she, Anna is a conservation biologist who has a, a really strong background also in environmental policy and education. She's the director of the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, which is, uh, of course, one of the world's preeminent natural history museums. She also teaches uh, at both Columbia University and NYU. Uh, and, um, and particularly pertinent uh, also to, to, to this program here is Anna is a native of Uruguay and uh, where the novel largely takes place and has um, extens extensive research experience on Uruguayan uh, arid land birds among many other topics. So welcome Anna and thank you for joining us here tonight. Um, uh, Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Slovic, um, who is joining us from Moscow, Idaho. Uh, Scott is a university distinguished professor of environmental humanities at the University of Idaho. Uh, Scott was the founding president of the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment and was the editor in chief of its flagship journal, um, uh, which is known as ILE, but is that stands for Interdisciplinary Studies in Literature Environment for an astounding 25 years um, from its inception until just about a month ago. So bravo for that incredible work. Um, Scott has um, written and edited more than 25 books, uh, which include eco-critical studies, anthologies of nature writing, uh, profiles of nature writers, and much more. And I think it's no stretch to say that Scott has played a key role in really defining the fields of eco-critical studies and environmental humanities. So Scott, thank you for joining us. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, sort of the guest of honor tonight is uh, Susan M. Gaines, who is uh, in Germany as we speak. Uh, Susan is a founding director and writer in residence at the Fiction Meets Science program at the University of Bremen in Germany. Um, uh, also very pertinent to this work in particular, Susan has a really uh, started out as a scientist and has a very strong background in both physical and biological sciences, including graduate study in chemistry at um, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, before she was sort of drawn away by her gifts as a storyteller and, and committed herself to writing full time. Her books, uh, which is, uh, includes two novels and another of nonfiction, all delve into to, uh, scientific topics. And I might editorialize with a lot of grace and, and incredibly, uh, and a lot of clarity. She's also written numerous other essays, short stories and more. And I think she's the only person I know that has published both in, in the scientific journal Nature and the North American Review, um, as well as many other uh, things spanning the breadth of, of uh, literature and nature. So, the flow, what we're gonna do here, the sort of the flow of how we will go is that um, in just a moment, I'm gonna invite Susan to, to share a bit about the genesis of the novel and then uh, to give us a taste of the work by reading an excerpt from it. Uh, after that, um, Anna and Scott uh, will each comment on the book, sort of putting it into a larger context. And then uh, the four of us will have some discussion around those things and then, um, then one of the most important parts, uh, which I'll explain the logistics of how it's going to work when we get there, is that we'll open up to questions uh, from you all who are who are uh, watching and participating from far away. So, um, so Susan, um, uh, welcome again. Thank you for joining us in the middle of your night. And um, could you tell us a little bit about the genesis of the book, and also then share um, a reading to give us a, a flavor of it. Thank you, Tom. That's that was a lovely introduction, and thank you to you and Zora and Bob for organizing this gathering to begin with. Um, I'm so honored that all of you out there have chosen to spend your evening with us. Uh, I wish I could see you, um, but at least I can see my co-conspirators here. So I'm just going to pretend like Anna and Scott and Tom are, are sitting here next to me. So if you see me turning, it's <laughs> to this sort of person that's actually up on the screen. Um, so for me, writing a novel is 
a really messy sort of business. It's sort of like cooking without a recipe. There's a lot of trial and error and tasting, and it takes longer than you expect. And by the time you finish, you don't re recognize the ingredients anymore. And some of those ingredients you have in the house, and some of you, them you have to borrow from the neighbor, and some of them you actually hunt down and buy. Uh, writing this particular book um, was particularly messy because it took so long. It's really more as if I lived this book than wrote it. And that's not because it's autobiographical, but because it followed me around for almost two decades. While I was living on three continents, working a gazillion jobs, writing another book, um, not to mention all the usual stuff like falling in love and taking care of a family. So when I first imagined this story, um, or the story that would become Accidentals, it was way back in 1999. And I was thinking about climate change and the end of nature as I had understood it coming of age in the 1970s. I was trying to fathom an economic system whose well-being depended on perpetual growth in a world of finite resources. And that was a system that no one seemed to even be talking about changing. I was thinking about my father and his Sierra Club style activism and about the political inertia that had infected me and it seemed the generation behind me, so our children's generation. I wanted an excuse to go bird watching. <laughs> it's a hobby that I hadn't indulged since I was a teenager. And finally, um, I was bothered or rather obsessed by some stories I'd been hearing for decades from one of my dearest oldest friends in California who happened to be from Uruguay. So those were the ingredients, uh, but I definitely didn't have them all at hand. And though I was convinced that they all fit together somehow, it would take me 15 years to figure out exactly how. Um, I'm going to read you a taste of the beginning of the book. I can't do a lot just to give you a sense of, of the characters. Um, now, you can see my face and hear my voice, so I have to warn you that you really aren't hearing from a middle-aged woman, you're hearing from a 23-year-old man. There was nothing particularly remarkable about the birds that day. No harbingers of apocalypse, no heralds of a new age. The last summer of the millennium was fading, and the fall migrants were en route to their summer homes as if nothing were amiss, the lagoon peppered with a seasonal medley of ducks. American widgeon, ruddy duck, surfscoat, or bufflehead, the names ticked through my head like a familiar, comforting litany. It seemed a bit early for buffleheads, but there were dozens of them bobbing about like bathtub toys, their heads flashing white in the late afternoon sun. I'd driven north to spend the weekend with mom, and she'd asked me to take her birding. This was not something we were in the habit of doing together, and I should have known she had some ulterior motive, especially when I saw what an elaborate picnic she'd packed. But I was a little slow on the uptake, if not the entirely oblivious hijo sonambulo that she'd accused me of being as a teenager, her sleepwalking son. I took her to a spot in Point Reyes that my grandfather used to like, a place I hadn't been back to since he died. It was one of those rare days when the Northern California coast was simultaneously free of wind and fog, and it felt good just to be away from the city in my tedious cubicle job. The place was more crowded than I remembered, with groups of hikers scattered along the lagoon trail. I paused to scan the water through the binoculars, reeling off species names for mom, who was, predictably, uninterested. She wasn't a birder, never had been. Neither was dad, for that matter though I learned everything I knew about birds from his father when I was a little boy. It was one of those things that skipped a generation, like the unruly Uruguayan eyebrows on the other side of the family, which had passed mom by and landed thick, black, and incongruous on my fair, freckled face. Grandpa Gordon took me tromping all over California, from the Sierra backcountry to the L.A. city dump, in search of birds. Bird watching had been his passion, his lifelong obsession, and he died birding in Tuolumne Meadows, collapsed with a heart attack, binoculars in hand. That was over a year ago, just before I graduated college, but it was only recently that I'd really begun to miss him. I wasn't obsessed like he'd been, but I did have the birder gene, somewhat diluted. It was more habit than anything, something I'd been born to. You went for a walk, you looked for birds. You went kayaking, you looked for birds. You went camping or fishing or climbed a mountain, 
you looked for birds. I'm going back, Mom announced, ignoring my recitations. Already? I scanned the dunes at the far end of the lagoon, focusing on a late nesting snowy plover. I never would have spotted it from so far away, but there was a sign announcing its presence and a group of people staring at it through binoculars. Apparently, snowy plovers had been eleg elevated to endangered species status since I was last here. Poor unassuming little peeps spent their life trying to avoid notice, and now here they were, the center of attention, like a display at a museum. Already? Mom echoed me. Hace más de 30 años. 31, actually. Summer, 1968. I lowered the binoculars and turned to mom. What are you talking about? Objectively speaking, my mom, my mother was unremarkable looking. Short graying brown hair, olive skin, features that were a bit too large for a face, thin, wiry body, average height. But to her friends and students and colleagues, she was a beautiful alien species, blazing with manic energy and intelligence, like a comet streaking across their suburban sky. She could also explode, of course, or more likely implode, but Dad and I were the only ones who ever saw that. At the moment, she had a bemused expression on her face and was quietly watching a fowl rope feeding in the shallow water a few yards from shore, the binoculars hanging unused around her neck. I'm going back to Uruguay, she said. Oh. When I was growing up, we'd gone to Uruguay to see her family every other Christmas, the way other families went to Iowa or New York, except we got summer and beaches instead of snow. I stopped going when I started college, but she and dad had gone together until a few years ago. That's a Wilson's fowler up, I added, just in case you're wondering. She shot me a look and smiled. I'm wondering why she does these pirouettes. He, it's a male. He's stirring up the crabs and bugs from the mud. I watched the fowl rope spinning and dipping like a drunken ballerina. What about dad? They still saw each other after all. I even suspected they slept together now and then, though I wasn't supposed to know this. Dad used to love to go to Uruguay, and mom's mother doted on him. Tu papa, she sighed. Tu papa se achancho. Whatever the hell that was supposed to mean. Dad had turned into a contented pig, a stick in the mud. I lifted the binoculars to watch a grebe that had just popped up from an underwater fishing excursion in the middle of a flock of scoters. Horned grebe with very large fish, I announced. It was having a hard time getting the fish down its gullet, bouncing along the surface of the water with the tail hanging out its mouth. I glanced at mom to see if she was watching, but she was still staring at the fowl rope, missing the show. They used to fight all the time when I was a kid, or rather mom fought and dad listened implacably, mumbling the occasional platitude, which only drove her into worse frenzies. Her threats to leave him had been their marriage's refrain, cries of woof that echoed unheeded through the caverns of my otherwise happy childhood. Until the woof arrived in truth two years ago. I was already in college, but it caught poor dad unawares. He thought they'd come safely around the bend to middle age and were home free. Mom, of course, had her own version. All your father cares about is that stupid job, she said as I watched the grebe come to terms with his fish. This American dream bullshit. What is that? Three cars and a big house with three bathrooms in a neighborhood with streets that don't go anywhere? Comfort. Striving for comfort that you already have. Dad has one car, I said, a Honda. We'd never lived in an especially big house or had three bathrooms either, but I let it go. We walked a little further along the edge of the lagoon and then headed up to the top of a grassy knoll for our picnic. Mom's rants against American materialism and suburbs were all pretty familiar, but I'd never heard her talk about dad with such disdain before. He wrote computer software for chemist, made a good middle-class salary. I knew it wasn't the money itself that bothered her, but the idea that ja dad took the job seriously when, like my job in Oakland, it seemed to have no worthwhile purpose besides the accrual of money. Dad called this practical. He strove for comfort, got it, and was content. What was so wrong with that? He ate well, worked, tossed a baseball with his son, and took him camping, fishing in the summer. He read books, went to movies, the occasional play or concert. I watched mom extract containers of food from the knapsacks, setting them out on the faded red bread spread she'd brought for us to sit on. Pasqualina, the charred and egg pie she made only for special occasions, slices of homemade bread and ham, tomatoes and sweet peppers from her garden, all my favorites. Dad cares about you, I said finally, and me. She looked up surprised. Ay, Gabrielito, she said quickly, laying her hand on my arm as if to stop the thought she'd let loose. 
Of course he cares about you, Bichito. He's a great father, a dear, dear man. She'd overstepped her own boundaries, I realized then, boundaries I hadn't until that moment been conscious of. She'd always been sarcastic with dad, sometimes to the point of downright meanness, but she had never, not in any of their worst moments, the myriad almost divorces that punctuated my childhood, said anything disrespectful about my father to me or to anyone else that I knew of. He was an irreproachably decent man, and she knew it for all that she'd spent half a lifetime reproaching him. I half shrugged, half nodded, acknowledging what was apparently an apology. Gabe, this is about me, and your father never dared to scratch the surface of that. She placed squares of pasqualina on plastic plates and handed me the one with the whole egg in the middle. I can't stand this big monster country anymore. She said this with such pronounced bitterness that I looked up from the tomatoes I was about to load onto my plate. I suddenly had the uneasy feeling that I'd been humming along to the wrong tune afternoon. I'm going back, Mom said when she saw the confused look on my face. Para siempre. A vivir. Al paisito. I stared at her. To live? You're moving to Montevideo? End of September. 34 days to be exact. My mother had lived in California for 30 years. She was a naturalized citizen who voted in every American election and grumbled when she listened to American news. She had a gringo ex-husband, or Yankee as the Uruguayans say, and a thoroughly Yankee son. She spoke English with a vocabulary that was more sophisticated than that of your average American. Oh, she clung to her Spanish accent, along with a few nostalgic affectations like drinking mate instead of coffee for breakfast, and she still scrambled up the slang. But according to her mother in Montevideo, she also spoke Spanish with an American accent. If leaving dad had been a not-so-surprising surprise, moving back to Uruguay was a total non-sequitur. Mom, I said. Don't you think this is a little sudden? And I think I better break off there um, and move on. Uh, we'll bring you into some of the more of the themes of the book as we as we talk. Um, so Gabe ends up being talked into joining Lily and going back um, to Uruguay. And he ends up staying longer than he intended. Uh, and most of the book is set there. Um, and the part I didn't get to in this in this early bit is that her dream is to go back and um, take over an abandoned ranch, an abandoned estancia that she's inherited with her brothers and um, turn it into an organic farm. And this doesn't go over quite too well with her brothers. And uh, so there's a lot of family feuds around that and other things. Um, now, when I first imagined this story, I had never even been to Uruguay. Um, but it was immediately apparent that that was where the book was going to be set, whether I liked it or not. And uh, no matter how many stories I'd heard and how much I read, I couldn't write a whole novel set in a country that I didn't know firsthand. So as chance would have it, when I went down to do the um, exploratory research, I felt immediately at home. So I returned, um, patched together some paid work, and I stayed for several years. Um, I had instant family and friends down there, which I inherited from my California friend. Um, and I made some new friends while I was doing my research. Among them, uh, Anna Porzakansky's parents. Um, Anna wasn't around much then, but uh, I met her father uh, when I wandered up to the eastern wetlands and looked for someone who knew about conservation and land use in the region. Um, and I have to tell you, I just had a very nice surprise before we started. Um, it turns out that the whole Porzakansky uh, clan seems to be gathered together um, in Florida of all places. <laughs> um, so, so I actually got to say hello. Um, Anna, uh, I don't know if I should have really outed this connection, um, because if you start talking about all the similarities to your own family history, it's going to look like I plagiarized it. Um, but I swear it was actually someone else's family history that I stole from and uh, partly invented. And it's only coincidental. <laughs> so, Anna. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Susan. It, it was such a delight. And, and so powerful to read this book, in part because of the connections that I saw to my, my life. But I think in many ways, they're kind of universal connections. But like Lily, the mother in the story, I'm a Uruguayan immigrant to the United States. And sometimes I find myself, you know, frustrated with my adoptive country. And I also find myself mothering, parenting American kids. 
And I often wonder if there's going to be a day where I have that conversation where it's like, you know what? I'm going back. Like, I wonder. I read that chapter and I was like, oh my God. Um, and then like the Kiroga family in your book, my parents were affected very much by, and my whole family, by the dictatorship in Uruguay, a 10-year pretty brutal military dictatorship uh, that caused us to leave the country. My parents were part of the resistance. And in fact, my mother has worked uh, and made, you know, she's an architect. She's built a memorial to the detained, disappeared in Uruguay and to the tortured and detained and disappeared in Argentina at some of the places, you know, including some of the places that may appear in the book. And finally, like Alejandra, the Uruguayan biologist in the story, I was a Uruguayan biologist and met a visiting American man. And, you know, you're, you're muted now. But uh, anyway, um, I just kept reading the book and thinking, wow. And, you know, the thing that really struck me the most is this subtle power fights that happen in the family about land, about politics, and just about life choices. I think that's very universal. But I think that could apply to everybody. And uh, I think the title Accidentals is really interesting too. Should we, can we, can I say a word about that? Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, for those who are not familiar, Accidental is um, uh, an unusual visitor from the bird world. So basically a bird that is found in a place that is outside their normal range, their normal breeding or migrating or wintering range. Um, you know, bird watchers get extremely excited about this because they get to see something they don't usually see. Um, and this can happen for many reasons, uh, but I think it's a very interesting metaphor for the characters in the book because some of them are on a one-way trip. Often, you know, accidentals or vagrants never make it back to their normal, their normal range. Um, uh, Grinnell called them barrier crossers in some way. So, you know, they're also crossing barriers that others in their group haven't crossed. It's a very interesting metaphor, I think. And what it made me think about that I thought was also very interesting is how birds relate to territory, to land, to place. And, you know, you can tell somebody's out of place, but what about human beings? Are we ever out of place in a place? And I think that, um, you know, different people have different attachments to land. This is actually something that we study and research and work on at the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation, how, uh, uh, you know, people's connection to place uh, is, is so important, but also and increasingly, many of us have shallow roots and move around and end up being all over the planet in this Anthropocene that we live in. And so I, I think it's an interesting meditation on our relationship to place. You're all muted, so <laughs> I'll pass it on to one of you, whoever's faster. <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, so yeah, that was, that's a really nice take on the, um, the many meanings of accidentals that reverberate through the book, which, uh, you know, when the title appeared, I wasn't, I, I, they came to me later and more and more keep getting pointed out to me by people who read the book. Um, but one thing I was thinking about the other day is that um, maybe is that, is that the books, the books all about immigrants of different kinds. I mean, everybody, and, and this is also very Uruguayan. I mean, there's, there was this grand um, diaspora uh, and, and it's, and, and, and it's about that. It's about, like you said, one, a different relate, different relationships to place that the individuals have um, and also the circumstances of, of their being gone. So there's, there's people who are in exile who come back and they have a very different experience than Lily who comes back, who had simply, simply immigrated. Um, and of course, that's part of the underlying tension uh, in the family. Um, and then there's Gabriel, who's really an accidental and um, kind of out of place. Uh, so anyway, I've been I've been thinking about this a lot. This is going off topic a bit, but I've been thinking about. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk about immigrants in the U.S., of course, and 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 the immigrants in 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 accidentals are all very quite privileged in the sense that uh you know they 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 come from middle class class backgrounds they all have educations they're actually um yeah they weren't always able to move back and forth to their country in fact they got chased from one country to another many of them um because of the political situation 
Uh, but I was just thinking about myself also in, in my, my life that um, I've spent probably the greater portion of my adult life outside of my native country and um, find myself, I found myself living in Germany for oof, almost over 15 years now um, and, and feeling kind of like an accidental here in ways that I actually didn't in, in Uruguay, interestingly enough. It's very strange because I think it, it also touches on the idea of belonging, right? Where do we belong? And, and even, uh, you know, in the last few weeks in the United States, there's been an interesting kind of confluence of things around bird watching and belonging, right? I don't know if you've paid attention and politics and racism, right? So bird, uh, a bird watcher was harassed, you know, in a racist incident in Central Park. And then bird watching became kind of like an act of resistance. You know, this movement started Black Birders Week. And it's been very exciting, I think, to see people kind of uh, using bird watching as a way to occupy that space, as a way to resist exclusion. And so I think, I think the connections are very, very interesting. Absolutely. The, and bird watching, certainly for many of us, being a fundamental practice of connecting to wherever we are. Um, I wanted to uh, ask Scott if you could um, maybe comment a little bit just on kind of moving to a sort of moving back a little bit and just about uh, the role of story more generally. You're a, a scholar of, of story, you might say. And um, kind of how does story work in in the human psyche really and and how does it help us activate attention and understanding um and also i think one of the really interesting things about about this book is that it that it's a novel um and so often we think of exploring uh some of these ideas of uh nature culture connections through you know nonfiction, but of course oftentimes fiction can be uh, truer and give us a more deeper insight, I think. So just curious what you might have to say in that realm. Great, yeah, thanks very much, Tom, and hello, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to join this great group for a conversation about Susan's wonderful new novel. Um, I've been a fan of Susan's work ever since I read Carbon Dreams about 20 years ago. Um, and so it was really wonderful to actually meet you in person, Susan, at, at the Astley Conference in Davis a year ago. That's the first time we met. Um, and you were handing out bookmarks for your forthcoming new novel <laughs> at the time, which I finally had a chance to read um, on the occasion of this event that we're doing right now. Um, one of the things I especially like, I don't know whether to speak in the in the second person or third person about Susan or to Susan. <laughs> one of the things I especially like about your uh, fiction, Susan, is how you develop uh, realistic and recognizable characters and believable representations of scientific questions and predicaments, um, such as what to do with scientific data that may be politically controversial. This was, was the captivating central question of carbon dreams and other kinds of um, questions relate or, or issues related to um, the, the scientific experience, not just scientific information, but the experience of doing science, conducting it, and um, understanding the implications of discoveries uh, emerge in accidentals. Uh, I only have a few minutes be before we return to the back and forth um, conversation, but I wanted to focus some overarching comments on um, the, the way story functions as a vehicle for conveying meaning. Uh, there's something about the language of story as opposed to other forms of communication that particularly grabs the attention and imagination of audiences. And I can tell Susan that you're especially attuned to the power of story because it becomes almost an explicit topic inside of your story. In a way, it's a story about stories, and some of this may have been intended in other aspects of this metafictional focus on storytelling may just be things that caught my eye as a, a frequent reader of literature who often looks for the way an author comments on her own methodologies and, and ideas, um, intentionally or not. So as you've suggested, Accidentals is a first-person narrative told from the perspective of a young man 
And on the very first page of the book, which you began reading to us a few minutes ago, Susan, we become immersed in narrator Gabriel Haynes's story about his relationship with his mother, his fascination with birds, and his exploration of various other relationships with places, friends, and family members. We begin to care about Gabe's questions and desires, his uncertainties about whether he should live in California or make a new life for himself in Uruguay, like his mother. And also we learn about his yearning to establish a relationship with this um, mysterious, uh, attractive scientist, Alejandra Silva, he encounters while birding in the wetland near his mother's new home in Uruguay. When we read a story like this, we graft our imaginations onto the lives of characters, even though we know them to be fictional. This is certainly the case with realistic narratives that represent characters in ways that make them seem alive and recognizable. As a result of this imaginative graft we become fascinated with ideas that pass through the minds of characters as expressed by the novelist, either in interior monologue or in dialogue between the characters, especially when the ideas are somehow connected to the characters' problems or goals within the story. Accidentals explores the question of what kind of language is effective as a way of telling the story of science. There's an implicit suggestion in the story, in the novel, that story is a viable and even a necessary means of conveying scientific information. For instance, and I've mentioned this to the other panelists before we got together today, there's a dinner scene uh, later in the novel where Alejandra is um, talking and excitedly about the microbial communities that she studies in her research. Um, and she pauses in the middle of this monologue during their dinner um, and asks Gabe, her dinner partner, and probably asks the reader at the same time, sorry, am I boring you? And then Gabe thinks to himself, not only um, as a fictional character, but in a way representing the reader as well. Bored? I had been listening with every sense engaged, subsumed in all levels of aesthetic, intellectual, and sensual pleasure, watching her talk, watching her eat. And it's as if the reader too is emerged in this scene, experiencing more than the abstract information about microbes. As we watch Susan's characters watch birds, plant vegetables, banter about family history, and discuss science and politics, we are also subsumed, to use Susan's word, on multiple levels in the fictional lives of the characters and in the novel's ideas. Eventually, we learn that Gabe's drawings of birds, his visual stories, have a special kind of truth that outweighs more scientific photos. Uh, the ornithologist Eduardo in the story tells him that a particular drawing, though a fictional creation, because it's based on multiple observations, told a truer, quote unquote, told a truer story than the limited hard facts of a photograph. And this is one of those metaphysical, uh, fictional uh, moments where the interaction between the characters seems to be commenting on the idea of telling a story in fiction anyway. What kind of truth emerges in fiction? There may be something truer, something more representative and evocative in a fictional narrative or a, a drawing than in a photograph or in a more technical non-fictional text. So um, just to kind of wrap up some comments, one of my particular scholarly interests is in how the human mind grasps, grasps or more often fails to grasp information about important things, about crises that are happening in our societies and on the planet more broadly. And very late in the novel, there's a moment where Alejandra in another one of these dialogues that includes mini monologues on, on abstract topics, um, Alejandra says to Gabe, that's exactly what we do, what we're hardwired to do. Save the babies. The car wreck is immediate. We know what it looks like, tangled metal, smashed heads. But the global cataclysm is just a concept. Climate change, mass extinction, too big to grasp, even if we're in the middle of it, even if we cause it, end quote. So this statement by one of the novel's central characters about how the human mind works, what we're hardwired to do, 
suggests that the, that Susan herself as a novelist is attuned to the very human struggle to process information about what's happening in the world. And this statement, which comes very late in the book, also addresses the power of story, not only to convey uh, scientific and political information, but to evoke attention and a sense of concern among readers and listeners towards serious phenomena in the world. This particular passage in the novel seems precisely relevant uh, to the issue of how we react to crises, ranging from political disaster to ecological destruction, both of which emerge in the, the story of accidentals. In small, subtle ways, questions about what we attend to and how we care or fail to care emerge throughout the book, such as the passage that Susan, another passage Susan read a few minutes ago, um, uh, in the opening bird watching scene where Gabe is trying to show his mother a horned grebe attempting to swallow a fish and his mother is still staring at the phalarope missing the show. So I read that little scene, which may just be an incidental narrative moment. It's about attention. What is Lily, the mother, paying attention to while Gabe is paying attention to something else? And this uh, use of story as a way of studying the, the flow and the um, kind of the strange fluctuations of our own attention, um, I, I read as an example of the story exploring the way the human mind works with regard to information and experience. Uh, at the same time, by focusing the novel on experiences of a few families and ultimately on a single couple, Gabe and Alejandra, and also on the mystery and presumed fragility of a single insta instance of avian accidentals, um, the, the rail um, birds that are noticed outside of their range, Susan seems to demonstrate how the human mind gravitates towards singularities, individual phenomena or small scale phenomena that are not quote unquote, too big to grasp. So this, this use of story to show how we attach ourselves to small scale phenomena as opposed to as representative somehow uh, or evocative of larger, more abstract phenomena uh, really comes to life, I think, in this story. So um, I'd be very interested if we have time to hear Susan weigh in a little bit at some point on her own artistic or your own artistic strategies for raising scientific and political issues and even issues of gender politics and family dynamics by weaving these into the fabric of narrative. Sometimes the risk of doing this, weaving ideas into narrative, is that um, or, or making story a vehicle for larger subjects is that the message is lost or muted by the indirectness of storytelling, if there is a message, um, and there isn't always an explicit or conscious message. Another risk, of course, is that the story starts to feel like an afterthought, merely a vehicle for information or ideology rather than the author's ultimate focus. And I don't think this is the case at all with accidentals. The characters and the story are vividly, richly presented. But I'd be interested to hear um, a, a little bit about a novelist and, and uh, in this case, your particular intuitive calculations as a storyteller regarding the use of the medium of narrative to explore larger ideas related to human experience. And this would include the use of dialogue um, as a narrative tool for presenting ideas on psychology, social history, ecology, and so forth. What is, what is the relationship between dialogue and other parts of narrative as a tool or a particular micro strategy of story, storytelling uh, in order to get ideas across without distracting too much from character relationships and, and other movement of, of the plot of the novel. Um, so uh, I have additional questions about the novel that I may ask during our conversation, but I'll stop speaking for now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Scott. Susan, would you like to respond to any of that? Yeah, I would. And, and I'd also like to hear from Anna on a couple of things. So, so there's a lot packed in there. Um, and I'm just going to mention one thing that I want to, I'm going to first talk a little bit about um, this, this idea of uh, the relationship between narrative and, and um, 
and the conveyance of information that you pointed to that, that seemed like your, your central question. But there's a question that's dearer to my heart that I would like to come back to, um, which has to do with uh, um, how, we, how we experience crises and because there's a major theme of the book there. And, and, and um, uh, so anyway, in terms of, I, I, as, I mean, as a novelist, of course, I think in a much more simple, I, I do a lot of these things intuitively and I think much more um, simplistically in some ways. Um, and so, so it's really fascinating to hear you sort of pick apart what I've done. <laughs> um, uh, I think that the bottom line is I'm writing, um, I'm really writing about knowledge as uh, and about people's relationship to knowledge um because i think that's something interesting and that we can do in a novel and it hasn't wasn't done that much in novels for a long time and because i'm doing that um you you because you and and, and then i'm writing characters that that you become involved in that you love or hate or and because you're involved in the characters you become involved in the knowledge um is that a conscious is that a trick on my part no am i trying to do it to convey the knowledge yes and no um i'm concerned with these characters and what they care about and so i bring the reader along on that on that journey um we i mean i didn't actually mean for this particular book to have as much science in it as it ended up having uh this just seems to be something that because i have basically uh, education in the sciences, I, I have a scientific worldview, you could say, and and that comes through in in, in my fiction. Um, so, in, in the program I run in in Germany, um, we focus a lot on this idea of of novels as a as a form of science communication, not not in the sense that they're trying to tell you facts about science, but in the sense that they're trying to uh, that they open up. The world of science for for people to understand sort of how it works and how it feels to do science and and be curious about things you wouldn't um, otherwise be curious about. If we broaden that to uh, to knowledge in general, um, there's a term that my friend Gene Hegland and I have 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 invented recently. Called, we've been calling these books nerd novels, um, and they're they're books that 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 you know you get a nice story you're reading a novel but they're they're also about they're about whole worlds of of knowledge um whether it's science or uh in the case of my friend Jean's book still time here's a plug wonderful book um it's about a shakespearean scholar so uh so someone who knows nothing about shakespeare gets sucked into that world and in in, in accidentals i hope that and i've it's actually been quite gratifying to hear people tell me that um uh, you know, they looked up every bird in the book. <laughs> um, and uh, another um, person who read it um, now, who's been on lockdown, said it was just so comforting and made her look at the birds on her deck outside her um, outside her apartment in a, in a whole different way. So, um, so coming back to this idea of, there was a lot in your thing, uh, this idea of um, our relationship to the small, well, I want to come back to that later, but to detail. So one of the things that, uh, one of the things that we do when we're experts on something is that we pay, we pay really close attention um, be, to, I mean, we're nerds, right? So we pay a lot more close attention to birds than anybody would think they would be interested in. Um, and of course, in a novel, you have to you have to walk that line and balance it. And sometimes I go over it and sometimes I don't. And, um, but, but I think my goal is to bring, to bring the reader into that world, into the world of, of, of my characters. Um, I think one other thing I want to say is that this whole idea of, of fiction as a, as a form of bringing people into worlds of knowledge can also be dangerous. And that's something uh, we don't talk about in fiction meet science enough because there's a lot of people that are that are very excited about this idea that um, you know you have people that could care less about birds or chemistry or um, one thing we haven't talked about in accidentals is the is Alejandra is a um, a, a microbiologist she studies microbial ecology um, so hopefully people 
get interested in the bugs <laughs> in the book. Um, so, but one of the dangers is that, of course, it's fiction and, and we have to know how to read fiction and, and there's no pretense And the book itself has to tell you how to read fiction. Um, so I'll just point to one of the most, the worst case scenarios of that was um, Michael Crichton's State of Fear, which probably did more damage to um, the conversation about climate change uh, than pretty much any other sort of cultural development that I can think of. I mean, they invited a novelist to speak to Congress about climate change, and he was not a scientist. He didn't know what he was talking about. Um, so anyway, I'll stop on that point there. And, and I just want to turn over to Anna to see if you have anything to say about I that. Have, and then, yeah. I have a couple of thoughts. Thank you. This has been fascinating. Um, you know, one thing that, that I keep circling back to is this idea of, um, well, a lot of things, but <laughs> let me just say that I, I do think that in conservation, which is a, um, a field where, you know, you need to be a bit of an optimist to be in this field right now. And uh, you know, Every time I go deep into climate change issues and new data and information, I, I end up thinking, you know, what's, what's really going to get us through to a new state or a new reality or is, is the arts. Because in a way, uh, scientists do have to imagine a possible outcomes, but, you know, we're not trained to imagine. And what we really need right now it's to imagine, imagine new futures, new ways of existing on the planet. And um, even, even imagine a new, a new way of doing science. Um, Susan, you just mentioned that you have a scientific worldview. And I was thinking, you know, that can mean many different things. And, and um, I can't help but think that there are debates about what it means to have a scientific worldview. And uh, at our center and with my colleagues, you know, we've 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 always uh, tried to use a systems lens to what to the work we do, and 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 yet you have to understand the details, right? So uh, with my colleague Eleanor, who I think is uh, listening in, and others, you know, we we came up with this idea that it's it's almost like a out of focus puzzle, and then you take a piece and you bring it into focus, but then you have to put it back in to see where it fits, and you have to zoom out. And you have to go back in and pick another piece. And, and this idea of iterating from the detail to the whole, I think, is, is what we need in, in, in addressing these scientific questions that, that we're facing that are global and complex and wicked, right? Um, and, um, and I think a novel is an interesting metaphor for that, too, because you do go deep. You go into the details. But then at the end, you're left with that whole arc, and you're left with the whole story, and you have something that adds up to more, right? Um, I'm also reminded of um, of this of this idea that that you know we've for a long time we've kind of made science very detached from emotions or uh, other aspects of our experience on, on the planet, um, and. You know, it makes me think of Alexander von Humboldt, for example. I read that wonderful biography that Andrea Wolf wrote a few years ago, The Invention of Nature. It really, uh, it was a, a, a fabulous book. And sh she talks about his insistence that we add, not remove ourselves and our emotions from scientific inquiry, that you need that to kind of create a whole. And I think some of the problems we're facing really are intricately connected to our culture, to our social context, and we're only going to solve them if we add it all in, if we try to get at that big picture and, you know, collaborate. And so I think, I think what it means to have a scientific view is also um, in flux and, and hopefully evolving as well, I, I think for all of us. Um, I, I'll stop there. I don't know if you have other other thoughts you wanted to say, Susan. I just want to jump in and say, uh, on behalf of the Natural History Institute, I'd just like to say amen. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, what you're saying about uh, sort of um, the need for emotion and imagination and how natural history really can propel that and, and is one of the most powerful propellants of that, I think. And it's one of the things I've found in the book. And, and as Scott said, you, you, so many of the elements uh, that are driven by the, by the fictional narrative are done so well. Um, and one of these is this tension that Anna just alluded to, which is what is really science and what is just natural history or just a naturalist and there's actually interesting dialogues back and forth 
between the two protagonists, uh, Gabe and uh, Alejandra, uh, you know, over the course of, of romantic dinners, they're, they're talking about what is, what is really science and what is not, and they're each sort of thinking that the other one is doing it right. But this idea is repeated in a number of different times in the book about the importance of empathy, uh, among other things. In um, the term natural history is not used so much, but that's definitely what's being described. Um, and uh, just, and that's certainly what our work at the Natural History Institute is is about all that. And and in fact, well, in fact, I'm I'm going to be involved in a session later this summer at the Ecological Society of America meetings. Uh, it's called Natural History as the Passionate Heart of Ecology. So um, it's coming. We're sort of unveiling well, that more and more. That's really terrific. One other idea that I was thinking about was that narratives, in a way, are at their core kind of mental models, right? Uh, of of in fact, one way you can build a mental model or a concept model of something is by then translating it into narrative, right? And so these are some of the richer tools I think we have to convey the complexity of the world. Um, and, and I like that idea that if, you know, and you left me thinking, Scott, really, if a narrative is like a mental model in a way, I think that's why they're so powerful to communicate and change and exchange what does a dialogue really mean then? You know, I was like thinking about that and the book has a lot of really uh, powerful dialogue and exchange. And in, in a way, I think it's also how a lot of the subtle conflicts are resolved um, or maybe they're not all resolved, but negotiated. Yeah, and I, I was gonna say something about the idea of empathy and, and the, um, you know, one of the primary actions of the novelist is to imagine other lives, characters' lives, to in, in the process of inventing these characters, to insert oneself into those imagined lives. And I think uh, one of the, and not to veer too far away from the natural history issue, because I think Tom has some things to tell us about natural history and science, but but uh, I, I would like to give you a chance to say a few words, Susan, about this this uh, maybe central trope of the entire book, which is to um, tell the story in the first person from the perspective of a 23 year old man. Um, and speaking of acts of empathy, kind of expanding your own imaginative experience, how did you come to do that? And what were the particular challenges of writing from that perspective? Um, okay, so let me back up just before I get to I just want to say a few words about this idea of, um, well, I don't know, um, Tom may be going to take us in that direction in a minute, but um, this, for me, there's a, there's a, I mean, Anna mentioned that a scientific worldview can mean many things <laughs> um, to many different people and types of scientists, of course. And to me, and one of the things that, that I've tried to do in Carbon Dreams and, and that also comes in into this book is that um, the scientist thinking is is not as systematic as we think it is. I mean, so which isn't to say which isn't to that's not to denigrate it. It's to just that I try to bring out the role of um, intuition, and I wouldn't say empathy, empathy. I would assign to the to the natural historian, um, but but there is almost a sense of. I mean, if you read Carbon Dream, she's almost empathetic with her molecules. I mean, I mean, there is a sense of of um, yeah, empathy is probably the right word um, of, of being inside of the subject that you and and so those things are often. Um, especially for people outside the scientific community and, and, and also within the scientific community um, hushed down because scientific method and scientific process, of course, requires us in the publications and stuff to, to reduce. I mean, it's kind of interesting that, that um, scientific writing has, has systematically um, subtracted narrative from the story, you have to subtract, subtract the subjective, and so you you get rid of all the the, the um, tools of narrative, and but there's a good you, reason for that. Yeah. Have you heard, Susan, though, that there is a movement now to where to put it back in through like yes. positionality statements, for example? So the scientist actually putting a statement in there about you know where they're coming from in the scientific paper. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, I think it is too, and I think. Um, Again, it's we have to be careful that you know, like a lot of these things, we don't go too far. But like, are allowing people to write a scientific paper 
with a um, a pronoun, you know, with a, a first person or, you know, or a we or an I in it so that you can say that we did this and not just it was done. <laughs> um, these things are actually important in, in, a, in a scientific paper. So, yeah, I have seen that there's a movement that there's a movement basically that we went too far <laughs> in um, neutralizing uh, narrative in um, scientific reporting. Um, so uh, where was I going with? Oh, I got to go back to um, what, Scott disappeared. Scott, are you still around? It, it, we may have lost him. For I think a while. we lost Scott temporarily. Hopefully, we're getting back. Maybe there's a lightning storm in Idaho. I oh, <laughs> so, I, I had a point I wanted to add. May I? May I just? Yeah, go for it. Um, I was thinking that you know the role of empathy actually uh, in in conservation. Uh, increasingly, you know, conservation biology started with a lot of natural history and a lot of people who cared for uh, wildlife and, and, and the ecosystems that surrounded them. But increasingly we realized that the real issue is managing human behavior, right? And, uh, and so it's become all about having the empathy to understand uh, these conflicts that are really among different humans about how to use resources, how to use territory, land, space. Uh, and, um, and without empathy, we can't communicate, negotiate, and get to the trust in a relationship where we can actually uh, kind of find scenarios that move us forward together, which is what really conservation needs to be about, I think, in, in, in a big part. Absolutely. Um, I want to want to move us towards opening up the conversation to the to the attend everybody watching and, and get to some question and answer here uh, momentarily. But I just would um, just add a, one other thing kind of linking the idea of natural history with the narrative and story, which is just the, to point out that, that the, the, the term itself, natural history, uh, was first coined 2000 years ago uh, in Latin, historia naturalis, which actually literally means the story of nature. Um, and there's often a misconception that it's only looking at the past, but it really is about the story. And of course, at any given moment, there's an infinite number of stories that can be discerned. And so, uh, and one of the things I marveled in this novel, Susan, is how many different stories you were able to weave together so deftly, including some very seemingly arcane topics. Uh, like, for example, I was really struck by how well you handled um, the, uh, uh, the the process of biological taxonomy and systematics and and the the use of genetics in naming because one of the things there's a there's a possible new species and but and over the course of a romantic dinner they're talking about this and I was like just done so well so but there's all these different levels of story so um, I am gonna um, uh, can I just weigh in for it really quickly? yeah absolutely yeah so um, uh, I just for the people who haven't read the book. Um, one of the driving stories in the book is is um, that Gabriel uh, stumbles upon a um, species of water bird, a rail, um, that he can't identify. And so uh, a lot of the book is around trying to figure out what this bird is and and um, where it came from, if it's endangered or not. Um, and I, I'll just say that the um, I was that, that was the the genetics of um, the taxonomic what is it called um, of the genetics was was unfamiliar territory for me so I had to go off on this whole other research I mean because that kind of all emerged during the period I was working on the book right, <laughs> um, right. so I had to go off on and and of course gradually all those themes came together because um, genetics play several roles in the book um, right. and uh, yeah so. Um, oh, and the other thing I was going to point out that, um, I mean, some of like the scene that, um, that uh, the little snippet that Scott read, um, that actually takes place while they're in bed. So they're not <laughs> always just sitting around having dinner. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm so sad that we lost Scott. <laughs> I know. Hopefully we'll get him back. Um, well, I want to open the conversation up to, we have a, a lot of um, uh wonderful people uh, participating from around the world. And so the way we're gonna do that is um, those of you who are, if you're not familiar with Zoom, in the menu bar down at the bottom, if you sort of hover with your cursor, you'll see a little uh, tab there for Q&A. Um, and you can click on that and then um, 
go ahead and type in a question if you have any, um, anything you'd like any of the panelists, except at the moment, unfortunately, Scott, but uh, to comment on. Um, and if, if, you, if you want to direct this to a, an individual, feel free, or if it's just to the entire panel. Um, and, and we'll just uh, give you a minute here to go ahead and type any questions or comments that you might have. And um, I, I have a question from someone who's just sent it to me via text, <laughs> <laughs> maybe sitting outside, um, who, <laughs> we can't hear you, Susan, but um, um, somebody is curious, you know, do we think that there's two types of imagination? Is there a different kind of imagination that you use in the arts or in li literature or is it, and in science, are they different? It's an interesting question. What do you think, Susan? You have to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Um, that's a really, really interesting question. Thank you, whoever threw that out there. Um, are there two? And, 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 and because I've kind of been in both worlds, um, I should be able to answer it, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, yes. <laughs> I mean, I think there's... <laughs> that covers it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, essentially, no. Uh, are there different kinds? I guess. I guess what I okay. I'm I'm figuring this out as I as I mumble along here. Um, and Anna, you have to answer this too. I, I I think like the scientific imagination is is um more contained, more systematic, more controlled, or more oh, used. More directed, perhaps. Or directed. Yeah, that's good. Um, so I mean, the basic idea of imagination, of course, is is kind of universal, but it's it's how it's employed, maybe. Um, I mean, I'll just like, okay, so like, so like in Carbon Dreams, the, 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 the lead character is a, is a, a young, um, organic geochemist, a young chemist, and she, um, she dreams about molecules, uh, <laughs> and, and, and sort of, um, sees, uh, chemical reactions, uh, in, it, it, metaphorically like human re, human interactions and uses that sort of uses that to drive her understanding of, uh, of of her observations you know she uses it to push her a little further beyond what beyond what you would it, I mean I call it intuition I mean it's this sort of fuzzy line between imagination and intuition um, yeah, I, I can imagine for example you know a climate scientist who's uh, tweaking climate models, for example, they have to imagine certain futures in a way that could almost be called dystopian, like a author would do it, mm -hmm. right? Almost. It's like, you know, but they may, they may say, well, this is, they, 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 at some point, they, they won't cross a certain boundary that maybe a writer will, potentially. I'm not yeah. sure. I mean, we also have limitations in the sense that, um, well, as a realist writer, uh, in the sense that it um, doesn't have to be realistic necessarily, but I have to be able to make you think it's realistic, <laughs> it should be plausible. Um, so yeah, yeah. Do we have any more questions? Uh, yeah, we have a question here from Chrissy Kolaya, excuse me if I don't pronounce your name right. Um, so who had a question for you, Susan, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about sustaining your work on a novel over such a long period of time as it develops and grows and were there moments in which you felt impatient with yourself and with the story? And she thanks us all. Um, yeah, okay, so I can't say that I sustained my work over such a long time because the novel got set aside um, qu quite, quite often um, for, Various. I mean, it got interrupted by um, a, a science book that I wrote, partly because um, someone invited me to write it, and there was money attached at a time when I had, um, as my friends in, that knew me when I was in Uruguay know, um, I had like no money <laughs> when I started this book and was doing all kinds of weird odd jobs. So, so when someone offered me money to write a book, I, I jumped on it and I thought I could write both books at the same time, but that did not work at all. Um, so this novel, it's so, so this novel got set aside in that in that instance for um, five six years, and when I, it, but it was never gone. So Gabrielle's voice was kind of always brewing, and 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 what I can say, I think it depends on the book. I mean, this one when I picked it up again, I was so excited and relieved that I was 
completely interested in it still. Um, I think that's the main thing about staying engaged is that you, they, that you have to really be interested. You can lose interest um, in a book if it, if it lasts too long. That said, uh, of course, every time I put it aside and picked it up again, it, it became a new beast and I had to rewrite the whole thing. <laughs> Susan, I, I'm curious though, um, were there pieces of it that were there from the beginning, like Lily or Gabe or, and maybe that was something you felt you couldn't abandon? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Gabriel's voice, for example. So Scott asked about writing from this perspective of this 23 year old male. Um, and I guess I'll answer that because it's connected. Um, I, I mean, I was, that, that, that came partly because I knew, I know a lot of young men <laughs> um, of, of Gabriel's generation. And so they, um, some of them kind of inspired partly this character and, and my thinking about um, uh, about who he was. Um, and, and I was interested in the mother-son relationship. Uh, so, I mean, at one point in the book, probably, I don't know, I was maybe 100, 150 pages into a, a very, very early draft. And I mean, that doesn't mean much because there's gazillions of pages that just never got into the book. Um, and I thought, why am I doing this? I'm making it really hard for myself. I'm writing a book in a country I hadn't lived in. You know, there's all this history. There's all this science. Why can't I at least write from the point of view of a young woman? So I, <laughs> I, I tried to do a, um, a gender, gender change um, operation on Gabe. And I, I turned him into a young woman. And I had to flip the genders of a lot of the other characters. And, uh, and I couldn't do it. I, I, you know, I mean, I, I wrote my way into a, a, a lot of the book doing that. And I just said, no, 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 because Gabe's voice was there pretty much from the beginning, pretty much from the, um, his personality, his essence was there just from the time I started the book. And Lily was there also. Um, so yeah, I no, loved, the basic components were there. I loved getting inside the mind of a of a young person who's been raised by a Uruguayan mother and gets Uruguay, the country, the culture, but also is an American and like sees it with the kind of, you know, affection and insight that an outsider, insider might, I, I'd like to think that that's how my daughters who grew up in the States, but going to Uruguay will, will grasp the culture, you know? Oh, good, thank you. Yeah, again, that authenticity I mentioned at the beginning on many different levels. I got a couple other questions here. Um, uh, this is from John Farnsworth. Hi, John. Uh, he says, I love the snippet about the snowy plover, a shy bird that lost some of its privacy by being declared an endangered species. And now there's a group of birders staring at it through their spotting scopes. There's critique here and it's political, but is it yours as the author, Susan? Um, is, is it your critique? Yeah, I don't know if it's, 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 so, so as I as I kind of noted at the beginning, um, a lot of what this book is about is, I mean, it's set at the turn of the millennium. Um, I don't know if that's in the first section, and uh, and it's about a young man who sort of grew up um, with concepts of nature like I have um, growing up in California. He's kind of he, he, partly through his grandfather, um, and and he's having to let go of them. So, so one of the central conflicts of the book is, is Gabriel and, and, and he, he lives this out with Alejandra to some extent, um, sort of mourning the loss of really wild places. And, 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 and to him, I mean, at some point, um, uh, there's a conversation about him having wanted to study natural history. And he's like, why would I study natural history? There's nothing left to study anymore, nothing left to discover. And it's not natural anymore. And, and those, were part of, those were parts of the conversations I was having with myself um, that once, once my understanding of carbon, of, of climate change um, took root, that, uh, that in the bigger picture, this idea of, or this idea of truly wild places on earth ceases to exist. And, and Gabriel comes around, I'm kind of giving away the end of the book here, but um, to, to saying, okay, um, but this idea of managed ecosystems, which is what we're left with. So we're trying to save the remnants. We're trying to reintroduce the California condor. We're trying to um, preserve bits of 
space um, where where creatures can where species can continue to survive. And so that's what we have left. And he's coming around, he's coming to terms with that, to this idea of of a, of a managed ecosystem as opposed to wild places. And so that I was playing with that. In, Which, you know, maybe maybe based on on a on a perhaps uh, very, I don't know, um, partial view of humanity's relationship to places, right? Because I think, for example, indigenous groups see themselves as intricately linked to the places and for millennia. And so that's, that's an interesting thing. You know, uh, Robin Kimmerer, who's a wonderful scientist and author, uh, whom I know you've worked with, Tom, in the past, you know, she gave a, a lecture at the museum at one of our events years ago, and she talked about the idea of not conserving the places or the ecosystems, but the relationship that people and those ecosystems have and how that's important too, right? And so I think when we think about restoring and managing, we have to think about not just restoring something that's outside of us, but restoring our relationship to it. Absolutely. Um, I've got um, three other questions here and I'm gonna um, put them out here uh, uh, one at a time. And then um, in interest of time, because people have been hanging in for a long time, then I'm gonna say that we'll probably we'll cut it off after these three questions. And I wanna ask Susan to read one more short little excerpt to kind of wrap up. Um, and uh, we'll uh, put some great questions here. So this, uh, this is from Richard Neville. Hello, Richard. He says, I would love, this is for Susan. I would love to hear more about your creative discovery processes. I he, how you enter a story or part of a story or a scientific question, or maybe you're trying to figure out what the right question is and how do you grope your way forward to moving forward from intuition to the actual written thing or scientific approach to answering the question? You're muted, Susan. Okay. Um, my process is really, really messy. So I'm not even sure I can answer that. Um, Oops, we okay? Yeah, so um, I, I usually, I'll come at it sideways. Um, I, I start out with the kinds of themes that I, these ingredients, um, those central themes that, that I sort of started off with. Um, and that's also a little bit of an answer to Chrissy's question about, uh, and, and what Anna said about staying with the book and what elements are there from the beginning. They are sort of these central, concerns um, that I'm exploring. And um, fig when that comes to, I think a crucial moment of, of when that begins to take form on the page does have to do with this idea of voice. And it's something I'm struggling with right now in the book I'm trying to start. Um, I'm, I'm at the point where I, I, have these, I have these themes, I have half a story, I have characters, and I, I, I can't yet hear the voice of, um, of the narrative voice, whether that's a first person one or a third person one or several voices that, that, hasn't, that hasn't come yet. And so I'm struggling with, um, with actually bringing the text to the page if that's, if that's what this question was about. Great, thanks. Um, question, I think this is also for you, Susan, from Juanita Baker. Um, oh. Of the relationships, which characters are very similar to your own personal relationships, mother, son, Okay. science mentors and uh, do you think about that while writing to either keep out or include certain truths um i'll say that sort of and, and probably any fiction writer will tell you this that um i draw on piece i draw on pieces of my i i mean in order to enter into a character you have to draw on things that you know either through direct experience or through um the experience of observed experience of loved ones and so um, so there's, there's a, a sort of a smorgasbord of pieces of me and, um, my experience in all of my characters. No. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So, and you want to know, I mean, oh, so I have to out this Juanita is in a um, book club that's asked me to visit them. Um, in, I think, is this the right, yeah, in Florida. So, um, so I guess they're reading the book now. And so you guys can ask more about that when I visit you um, by Zoom. Um, but um, of the characters I identify with, I guess if, if that's the question, uh, 
a lot with a lot of Gabe's issues, even though he's a 23 year old boy. Um, uh, some like of it, Lily's issue. Yeah, go for it. I was going to say, like, I always thought Lily, I thought you identified with Lily. I'm like surprised you're, 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 think, you know, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, Lily, uh, there's pieces of, uh, there's pieces of friends in these. I mean, there's, so there's people I love that I drew on and then there's things that, that, that are just completely made up, but that come connected to all those things. So, um, I'm trying to think, uh, um, grandpa Gordon, you know, there's pieces of someone I love and grandpa Gordon, um, Awella, there's, uh, he was one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, Sophia, if you're listening, <laughs> Graciela, if you're listening. <laughs> so, so Awella was definitely based on a, um, a person I know. Grandmother. Right. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. This is Gabe's grandmother, and she's she's quite a character. And um, the she's a she's a blown up uh, version of um, a person that I that I actually knew that um, some of my friends also knew and 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 cared about. And um, and then I took off from there, sort of. Yeah. So um, got one more question. It's kind of a big one. Um, oh. It's for all of us, and then um, we'll try to kind of keep ourselves succinct here. And, um, and then again, we'll have Susan uh, do another short reading. So, oh, Scott is back. Oh. <laughs> Welcome back, Scott. He can't hear us yet, I think. Um, so um, the, this question is from Liz Makings. Hi, Liz. Liz is actually a member of the uh, Institute's Scientific Advisory Council. Welcome back, Scott. <laughs> um, so, um, so Liz says, sorry to be heavy, but in light of how much we are struggling with the realities of recent events, including uh, um, climate change, social injustice, habitat destruction, can this wonderful panel speak to their advice on how to be hopeful and positive? I'm happy to start. Go for it, Anna. You go for it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we get asked this question a lot uh, as conservationists uh, in many events I've had at the museum. Uh, we, we get asked this a lot. Um, uh, and I don't think I have a simple answer, but you know, two things I can mention are that one, one thing that, that gives me hope is the fact that we still have this ability to uh, try to be part of building a better world and wonderful people to join arms with to do it. And that continues to happen. And that always brings me hope. Um, the second thing is that I feel there is a, I've always said, I've always thought that, you know, there is this vision in systems uh, thinking that, you know, if you're always focused on the events, you're not really focusing on the real structures and the real mindsets that bring about those events. I feel like that's happening now. People are really focusing on system-wide issues, on uh, real uh, profound, I think, drivers of problems. And I think we're changing you know, our thinking, not just our tinkering with our practices. We realize we need a new mindset, a new way of thinking, a new way of imagining. And I think that makes me very hopeful. Not that there isn't a lot to mourn or a lot to worry about. There certainly is. Thanks, Anna. Um, Scott, welcome back. I'm sorry we lost you, but I'm glad you made your way back. Um, did you hear the question? Um, I heard the question had to do with how, how do we maintain hopefulness at yeah. a time when there's so much to be distressed about. This is something that I actually think about quite a lot in my work, and particularly because I spend so much time working with students who are uh, often, uh, you know, particularly uh, concerned about the, the state of the world and, and they don't necessarily have the uh, breadth of experience that kind of uh, provides balance and, and almost cushions the um, 
the painfulness of each bit of uh, bad news that we receive. Um, I often, rather than thinking broadly and on a larger system, I think there's certain hopefulness to be gained by thinking on a small scale about what is more manageable within our own lives, rather than necessarily hoping for an, um, kind of a, an optimistic perspective that everything will just work out fine, don't worry, uh, life is is uh, like a Walt Disney movie. Rather, we can be hopeful in the small moments of our lives and do the best we can through our own efforts um, and you know, kind of make the most on this small scale rather than worrying about you know, what the ultimate future of the planet or of the species might be. So um, you know, while it's important, I think, to, to work toward uh, radical and uh, profound new ways of uh, in, uh, imagining the entire quote unquote system, I think often hopefulness is to be gained by, by thinking more intimately about the contributions we can each make from day to day. Great, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll make a quick comment and then turn it over to you, Susan, and then that can lead right into you, okay. giving us a, a little parting gift of a, another snippet of reading. Um, well, my response to Liz's question would be uh, essentially two things come immediately to mind. And one, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, is natural history is part of the solution. And by that, I define natural history as um, the, uh, uh, the practice of intentional focused uh, attentiveness to the more than human world guided by honesty and accuracy. So it's a kind of expansive definition, which is essentially paying attention to the world around us and the fact is, we all, every person in the world was born to do this. This is, and I'm speaking as a biologist here, we were evolved to do this. It's how, it's how our senses and everything is. And so what I have found as, as my, my career has sort of morphed from being more of a conservation biologist to being an advocate for natural history is, is to being blown away by the, the sort of receptivity to that idea from all sorts of people. Like we are, people want to connect with the world and we just have to sort of, and our cultures have, have, have sort of taught us at some point that, okay, now it's no longer relevant. And so now go grow up and do real work. But, but that's really not true as this novel not very nicely exemplifies. And so I think that we can, um, uh, uh, I find a lot of hope in how ready people are to reconnect with the world. And, um, and, and the second thing I was going to say is in a good example of that, which is simply children. Um, it's hard to be absolutely cynical with, with children in the world. And, and children are great naturalists. And if you look at any child anywhere in the world, in any culture, speaking any language, you'll find that they do the same thing, which is, is like every toddler in the world goes out and starts tasting the world and picking things up and checking them out. And, and so it really is inherent to us. And we just have to help keep working at opening that up and those opportunities up uh, to one another. So those two things make me hopeful. Should I jump in? So yeah, Susan, if you could, uh, yeah. any comment you want to make about that, and then just go ahead and, and um, uh, then give us a, a sort of final short reading and I'll jump back in at the end just to sort of close this down. So thanks a lot. So so first I just want to really thank the three of you for your answers to that question. <laughs> um, uh, I would say um, Scott and, and, and Tom's answers, these sort of individual relationships um, uh, are, are, are basically what what accidentals is about and 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 I have to say that it's the book itself is more hopeful than I as a as a per I personally feel <laughs> sorry <laughs> didn't mean to shoot that down um and I tend to, maybe it's a scientist in me but I tend to um I think what what Anna says is is true that we do see see glimmers of sort of what what I was missing I mean what what Gabriella is sort of flirting around with of of why is nobody thinking systematically of systems change um, because because some of the problems that fa that are facing us now are so are global I mean that's the problem it's it's global systems um, uh, the other sort of less hopeful part of accidentals and um, which we're actually seeing at the moment um, 
should I even say this? I'm kind of raining on the parade. Oh, well, is, is, is this sense that, um, and Scott brought this up earlier about um, how we handle crises. And, and one thing, one thing that this novel is about is, is how in sort of in the background, um, how these sort of very immediate um, crises were, 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 were threatened um, were threatened by uh, torture and dictatorship in Uruguay. Were threatened by um, 9/11. Were threatened by war. Were threatened at the moment by the coronavirus. Repeatedly, historically, over the over the last decades, it always seems to me that just when we're about to address these larger environmental issues, um, uh, something like that comes along and distracts us again. Because it's it's right here in front of our face. We, it's it's the scene that that Scott read where, you know, you're you're do you save your baby from the car wreck that's happening right now, you know, or 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 do you you know kind of look down the road? Um, so that's that's rather frustrating, and um, uh, I'll just um, stop there <laughs> before I rain on the parade completely. But but like like Anna said, one thing that that, that has come out of this and, and also out of these horrible finally <laughs> centuries um murders of, of of young black men is is that people are really really are starting to to wake up and look on on various levels and on various issues about uh, at at systemic uh problems and systemic change in these sort of large scale. So I think that does play a role. Um, I think for our personal sanity, we need those. We need um, we, we we need our our personal relationships with nature, and we need those small scale um, hopes. But in the big picture, so I'm going to read um, just a few pages, just to end us up here. Um, and this is a scene very close to the end. It's that close to the end of the book, so you're not going to know totally what's going on. Um, but I'll tell you that um, Ga Lily has just told Gabriel um, some 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 things about um, the family history that he didn't really want to hear um, that that have traumatized him. And um, they're up at the estancia, they're at the ranch, um, and uh, in this scene you'll see um, the marsh, which is a major figure in the in the book. Um, there's a there's a little bit of um, Virgin Marsh on the Estancia, which uh, Gabriel spends a good part of the book um, bird watching in, um, and you'll also meet um, this guy. This is the the Nandu. I don't know if you can see that. Who's on the cover? He's he's headless here. He's not really headless in the book, um, and his name is. There's a pet Nandu in the book, and his name is Angelito. I ran out to the yard and puked into the dusk copping up the beer and salad and empanadas I'd just consumed, startling Angelito, who must have been lying next to the door. Gabe, she'd followed me out, and now she reached to hug me, but I took a step back and shook my head in such an incoherent froth of rage and incomprehension I feared I might slap her. I turned and started walking away, and then I was running, stumbling across the yard in the moonlight, across the terros field and up the incline toward the creek, her cries following me a doleful keening calling my name, the name of a dead man, a phantom. I ran until the reeds loomed up in front of me, and only as I plunged into them did I realize that Angelito was with me. I stopped and stepped back into the open, giving him a push toward home. He trotted around a little circle and then lunged at me, twisting his neck around to bite my arm. He was as tall as my hip now, stronger than I would have imagined, and we danced around each other like two wrestlers until I caught hold of his neck in a sort of headlock. Go home, I pleaded, tears flooding into a reed cut on my face, the welcome burn of salt and wound, though I hadn't known I was crying. I carefully eased my grip and pushed him away. He stood stock still. Go! I felt around on the ground for a pebble and threw it at him. He trotted a few places, stopped. I found another pebble and another, and then I showered him with small rocks and mud clods until he finally trotted off the way we'd come and left me to my own self-flagellating path. It was darker among the reeds, and I moved my blindly forward at the full mercy of contradictory impulses, letting the reeds slice unimpeded into my face, tempting the marsh to swallow me, but moving along the path of least resistance, vaguely aware that my mindless flight had a destination. 
The pool was glistening in the moonlight, its occupants asleep in the shadows, indifferent as I made my way past them into the black heart of the marsh, grabbing at branches and yanking myself free with adrenaline-fueled efficiency each time the ground gave way and the macabre otherworldly suck of quicksand threatened to bring me down. I knew the way too well, and it was no accident that I found the little island near the rail's dismantled nest. I collapsed in the grass and slept. I dreamed a collage of homesickness, the smell of redwood humus curled up in the damp, fire-hollowed heart of a giant tree, rain in the woods. Grandpa Gordon grinning with a California condor perched on his head. Dad tossing M&Ms over the back of his backpack for me to catch as we climbed on a steep trail and the froth of Pacific waves rolling back into a receding ocean, washing it all away, leaving me with a self that was as blank as the wet sand, a flock of sanderlings scurrying across it in random patterns, but leaving no footprints. I awoke to a feeling of loss and denial so profound it would have driven me back into my confused dream, but for the hollow wail of a certain familiar species of bird, unnervingly close. I lay still, listening to the trills running repeatedly down the scale like a skipping CD, opening my eyes on a dark so intense it rendered the action irrelevant, registering wet clothes and cut face and mosquito bites, physical indifference, mental lethargy. The moon must have set, and the dawn was nowhere apparent. It was too dark to see anything but the tiny patch of stars that blinked through an opening in the brush above where I lay. The rails sounded so close I thought they might run out or they might run out across my outstretched arm. I could even hear the, hear the delicate peeping of chicks between the trills, which seemed to encircle me, overlapping and coinciding, syncopated in a way I'd never heard them, to my right, to my left, behind my head, as though I were lying in the middle of a trio of trilling bassoons. I laughed. There were three rails, not two. They were nocturnal, active when only owls and night herons and nightjars should be up and about. The laugh immediately collapsed into my chest, a soft, joyless bark. Do you have for a name for yourselves, I whispered, or maybe I just thought it. Lateralis or Ralis or Parteralis or something else entirely? Do you know who you are? Is that a thing you know in your access ramp building bird brains, who you are? What science has yet to discover? They started moving away from me, fading gradually into the marsh. And finally, they stopped calling altogether. And for a while, the night was almost as quiet as it was dark. Good night. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. And congratulations again on this wonderful book, which obviously all of the panelists urge all of you to go out and get and read. Um, I uh, just want to close by thanking all of the panelists, um, Susan, Anna, and Scott. Thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, thank you to all of you who have who have been following um, and hanging in for a fairly long time from all over. So thanks so much. Uh, so we'll be closing down. There'll be uh, there's a link uh, to purchasing the book through the Peregrine Book Company, and um, that just got put into the chat. Thank you, Zora. Um, and all, as we close, the uh, Natural History Institute's website and so on will be on the, on the closing screen. And we, again, encourage you to uh, uh, check out some of our other programs as well. So thank you so much, everybody. And we'll call it a, call it a night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really. Thanks for coming. <laughs>